Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining in. Uh, thanks for joining today's joint webinar by WSL2 and Ping Identity. Uh, this is a one hour webinar. I'll be moderating the webinar. My name is Mehfan. Uh, joining me would be Francois from Ping Identity, and we'll go into those introductions shortly. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. One, uh, in terms of the recording and the slides, we'll be sharing that right after this session uh, within, within the day. Uh, so watch out for that. Uh, we'll also host some of these material uh, on our site websites as well. So you can fetch some of them from there. Uh, and, and secondly, in terms of questions, if you look at the go to webinar control panel that you have, uh, you'll have a questions tab and, and you can basically go and add any of those questions in there. And then we'll respond to the questions towards the end of the session or if, if relevant uh, during the session as well. All right, let's let's get started. Uh, as you can see, our, uh, our basically our topic is on security on fire how API security affects the digital healthcare ecosystem. We'll be talking about the, the CMS regulation, the ONC rules, uh, what FHIR means. So there's a lot of jargon in here, but we'll explain what that means as well. Okay, uh, in terms of the agenda, uh, I'll basically talk a little bit about Ping Identity and WSO2. Uh, you can see Francois on the screen as well, so Francois will jump in as well. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the 21st Century Cures Act and what the security requirements and the needs are as part of that act. Uh, we'll also talk about how WSO2 and Ping Identity can help. And as part of that topic, we'll go into a deeper dive into the, the areas that WSO2 covers, the areas Ping Identity covers, uh, and an overall focus on the security side of things. Uh, following that, we'll, we'll basically have the next steps and call to action and, and how you can follow up and we'll address questions uh, following that. All right, uh, just to introduce ourselves. Uh, so on the call, uh, we have myself, of course, Mifan Karim. I'm the Vice President of Solutions Architecture at WSO2, and I also head our healthcare solution vertical, a uh, healthcare vertical and healthcare solution uh, at WSO2. I've been with the company for uh, eight years now, uh, and I head the global solutions architecture team. Uh, which is the team that works very closely with customers on, on all uh, technical aspects. Uh, on the call, we were supposed to have Barber, uh, who is the CTO West of Ping Identity. Unfortunately, Barber couldn't join today. Uh, but we, we have Francois, uh, who is the field CTO of Ping Identity. Uh, Francois, do you want to say a quick hi? Hey, Mufan, thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining the webinar. Uh, I'm Francois Sells. I am member of the office of the CTO at Ping Identity. I look at uh, API security. Uh, I've been at Ping for two years now. And uh, prior to that, I come from an API management background where I, I was for the last almost couple of decades. So great to be on. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Thanks, Francois. All right. And a little bit about our partnership as well. Uh, as you know, WSO2 and Ping space in, plays in the technology space. Uh, WSO2 provides technology for digital transformation, which includes API management and integration as, as one of the core areas, and identity access management as another core area. Uh, so we use these technologies to be, basically provide digital transformation solutions to customers. Uh, Ping Identity basically is a champion for identity to enable secure and extraordinary digital experiences. Uh, and, and Ping has been in the field for a long time, focusing on the identity side, the API security side, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so this is a great partnership. We are very excited. Uh, both companies going together, uh, talking about the uh, Cures Act and the CMS regulations. And the healthcare space is, is huge. And, and there are a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities in the healthcare space. So this is a great opportunity for both of us to come together. All right, let me jump di uh, jump right in to the presentation, uh, and I'll I'll take it from here. Uh, so for the rest of uh, for until the halfway of the presentation, I'll go. I'll first talk about what the rule is, what the regulations are, what the security requirements are as part of that rule, and what it really means for for patients, for providers. Uh, for ISVs, OEMs, vendors, so on and so forth. So we'll talk about that part first. 
Secondly, I'll go into details of the interoperability side of the story. How do you expose APIs? How do you connect to backends? What are the security aspects of, of that part of the story? Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll end up with the consent management side. Once I do the consent management, Francois would take it from there and Francois would talk about how the API security side works and, and how you would uh, do artificial intelligence based API security. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, there are three reasons and, and, and these are like a way of summarizing why the ONC regulation exists, right? Uh, and, uh, and basically one key reason is of course to make data available to individuals. Right? Uh, secondly, to drive participation in value-based contracts, and third, to support care coordination in population health. Uh, as you know, healthcare is a, is a three trillion dollar plus industry, and the pandemic has just accelerated the requirement for digital health, uh, especially in the U.S. and in the uh, rest of the world. A couple of years ago, healthcare was one of the industries which was really lagging behind other industries when it came to the digital side of things. Uh, there, there have been a lot of improvements and expansions in the travel industry, in the retail industry, in terms of e-commerce sites, uh, and recently in the banking and finance industry as well. But if you look at healthcare, data still sits in silos. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult to transfer data between providers, between payers, between providers and payers, so on and so forth, right? And, and we've, we've gone through that. But during the pandemic and during 2020 and the latter part of 2019, there's been a lot of transformation. Uh, the pandemic has really accelerated that, accelerated the requirements, and patients have started to expect uh, digital formats and digital healthcare, healthcare as the norm, right? and, and we're seeing that quite a bit. Uh, a major part of this is to be able to make this data available to individuals, right? and, and that's, that's the key. The ability to take data from multiple systems, from multiple sources, uh, normalize that data, anonymize that data, integrate and make that data a common format, and then exposing those data in, in standard compliant APIs is key uh, to any digital transformation initiative in the healthcare domain. So that's that's point number one. Uh, just before the pandemic, we also see this saw this whole initiative towards value-based contracts, right? So moving from service-based, uh, where you pay for services. Uh, to basically you pay for value, right? Where the risk is assumed by both parties, right? By the providers, by the payers, uh, but you you really focus on the outcomes. Uh, the pandemic introduced certain challenges for that part of the story as well, but that's that's a huge uh, industry in the US and, and both payers and providers are really gearing themselves towards value-based contracts or outcome-based uh, patient care. And then of course, you need the data and you need the innovation and the integration that the data brings to support care coordination and population health in, in the area. So that's the why part of the story. Uh, and if you look at the timelines, if you follow, closely follow the ONC regulations timelines and the CMS timelines, which comes from uh, the Center for Medicare, Medicaid Services, as well as the Health and Human Services Department. There are different timelines. Some of these timelines have shifted during, uh, due to the pandemic. For instance, if you look at the patient access API, which calls for payers exposing patient data as fire compliant APIs and standard compliant APIs to smart on fire applications, right? Of course, with the patient's consent. Uh, the original deadline was around January, 2021, and then that was deferred to July, 2021, which is just around the corner. Uh, there's a provider directory and formulary API deadline, compliance deadline as well. There's the whole payer-to-payer -payer data exchange where payers can exchange data between payers. Uh, of course, the provider directory means you expose data about the providers you work with. The admission discharge transfer notification deals with uh, sending alerts and notifications when uh, a, a Medicare patient basically is transferred or discharged, etc. And then, of course, the information blocking rule, which is a critical rule, talks about basically exposing the right kind of data to applications as long as the patient provides consent so that you can uh, provide like better healthcare initiatives and better uh, healthcare innovations. Right? So, so the deadlines are important because there are 
there are implications of not sticking to the deadlines. This is, of course, a compliance deadline, right? And we've seen in the past, similar with the banking as well, and open banking in the European region, that compliance and regulations also trigger digital transformation initiatives, right? So there is, there is a massive opportunity here, and, and that's what we are all interested in. Um, so if you look at the high-level security-specific requirements of the regulations, right? Uh, and, and you can summarize it into these various parts. So, so first is you build and deploy APIs, right? and, and these APIs need to be exposed in a standard format. The standard format referred to here is FHIR, F-H-I-R, if you can see that in the slides, which stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Uh, if, if you haven't heard of that, that's basically one of the HL7 versions, which is the release four version and a backward compatible version. Right? But it's at the end of the day, it's a it's a very popular version of the HL7 uh, standard. And the APIs that need to be exposed need to be exposed in a fire compliance standard. So it's not just the APIs. If you're connecting to the backends, and if the backends uh, need to connect and need to expose APIs, those need to be exposed in a fire compliance standard as well. The advantage of a standards compliant model is that you have an ecosystem where applications know exactly what kind of APIs would be available and, and what kind of formats and what version that API is going to be in so that you can start building this whole ecosystem around healthcare. So secondly, of course, as I mentioned, connecting and consolidating from multiple sources, uh, which means there's a security aspect of that as well. Like you need to ensure that the data coming in is secure, it's accurate, it's valid, it's timely. Right? So all of those aspects uh, come into the play when it comes to the backend data sources. Developer registration is key because the, regu the FHIR regulation and the CMS and ONC regulations talk about third-party applications consuming data. Right? What this means is you, you need to enable access to these third-party developers to come register their applications. There might be like workflows associated with that. And then you need to enable patients to provide consent to their data. Right? So the developer registration process is, is a critical security part of this whole uh, ecosystem and the whole picture. Uh, patients exchanging data between payers and between payers and providers right? using US CDI uh, version one, uh, that's a critical security part. Uh, being able to figure out whether this patient is who he or she says they are. Right. So being able to verify the patients, verify members prior to transferring their electronic health records, and not just the patients, but maybe someone related to the patient, like the child of a patient or the father of a patient. Right. So delegation is critical as well. And then finally, uh, last but not least, collecting, managing, and enforcing consent, uh, basically around the data. Right. So as a patient, I should be able to provide consent to very specific parts of my API or my data to a certain application. And at any point, I should be able to go in and revoke access uh, to that application for my data as well. So those are the high level security specific requirements. And how does Ping and WSO2 help? There are, there are various ways and we'll go into details. But one of the key things is you have the ability of having a single user store outside of your backend electronic medical record or electronic health record system, right? providing you a single view of users across the system. So if you, if you look at that problem specifically, the EMR, EHR is just one part of your total healthcare ecosystem. Right? And then there are many other parts. So you need a layer that sits above all of these that can talk to all of the systems and you need a single view of users across all of these systems. Pre-built Fire APIs and the ability to have a healthcare API marketplace is key. And, and that's something uh, the partnership uh, we as a partnership we provide authentication access and access control uh, and with mechanisms like passwordless uh, one-time passwords so, so on and so forth uh, which are scalable and consumer centric so users the end users need to authenticate the systems uh, should be able to authenticate you need to be able to figure out access control basically who gets access to what when and where so on and so forth Fire accelerators, so you need certain types of accelerators that can basically rapidly uh, provide you with a platform so that you can, can uh, enable these data sources and connect to these data sources. Right? So there's multiple models there which we'll look at. A patient-centric consent 
driven dynamic authorization. So that's key. And we, we looked at that in the previous slide as well. But consent management focused on the patient. And then, of course, you have the monitoring and metering side, visibility into all the activities, the ability to monitor that, the ability to derive business insights from that, and the ability to basically audit uh, what, what happened in the system. Right? That's key. And then finally, identifying and blocking anomalies and abnormalities using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, and that's one of the uh, aspects Francois would be focusing on in a bit. All right, so getting into the meat of the products, as I mentioned, there are two parts of the solution uh, and, and we're working jointly on this. There's a WSO2 component and, and there's a ping identity component. Let me try to clarify what those components are. And as a vendor or as a user, you have the ability of picking and choosing which components to use. Uh, so A, as, as part of this whole platform, what we are providing is an API-driven interoperability solution for healthcare organizations. And these healthcare organizations can be broadly categorized into the providers, which are the, the hospitals, the nursing care homes, et cetera, or the payers, uh, the, which are the insurance companies. But at the same time, there are other stakeholders in the ecosystem as well. And, and what, what this platform really provides is an API-enabled interoperability platform, which can connect to multiple backend systems, including like EMR systems, EHR systems, or any generic systems like a payroll system or, or your Salesforce, et cetera, and which can form uh, the core part of a health information enterprise, an HIE. Uh, as part of this, this also caters to the regulations, so HL7 and Firebase APIs, which caters to the ONC uh, information blocking rule, as well as the patient access final rule as part of CMS. But it doesn't stop there. You can go well beyond that and build your total uh, API strategy, your digital API strategy as well. So when I mention stakeholders, you of course have the providers who provide services to the patients. Right? And, and providers need a platform where you can expose APIs uh, to applications that the patient, patient is using. Payers need a platform that can expose APIs to the applications that pa uh, patients are using. But at the same time, payers and providers need to communicate via standard compliant protocols as well. So there'll be interfaces that the providers can consume from payers and vice versa. But it doesn't stop there because vendors like the EMR, EHR systems also often have to expose the patient data or any other data like claims data in a standard compliant manner, right? which means they need an integration platform that can fetch data from multiple sources and expose that as HL7v2 or DSTU2 or FIRE. So, so you need that integration platform at a vendor level as well as a supplier level as well. And then of course, government plays a huge role as part of this ecosystem. Okay, so in terms of the healthcare interoperability platform, I'll, I'll go into three different architecture diagrams. The first one is this, which gives you a high level business architecture view. Uh, in, in this, you have what's shown in the orange box, which is the WSO2 Open Healthcare plus Ping Healthcare platform. Right? So that's the total platform. Uh, the consumers at the top of that diagram, if you look at that, are the smart on fire applications. So smart is again another standard uh, as part of HL7. So smart on fire are, is basically a set of standards and a standard mechanism of how applications would consume these APIs. And, and there's a lot of open ID connect regulation uh, specifications in there so smart on fire applications uh, so who the people who build smart on fire applications are application developers third party application developers uh, the cms predicts that there's going to be a boost and, and there's going to be an explosion of healthcare apps in 2021 and beyond and, and the whole healthcare app ecosystem is going to really take off uh, the, the tech giants like Google, Apple, and so on and so forth have already started down this journey. Uh, there are a lot of wearable devices coming into the play as well. So application developers will have a huge role here. So application developers need to register as part of a marketplace. So that's where this developer portal component comes in, where you register your application, you go through a workflow, and you get validated. Right? So that's, that's your whole uh, marketplace part. 
once you've built your application and once you've obtained your keys and you obtain permission and validation and you register, then your Smart on Fire app consumes the APIs. So there's a patient or user or a doctor or, or someone from the insurance company who's going to use different types of Smart on Fire apps and those consume APIs. So in the, in the regulation, the APIs are exposed via Fire servers. Fire servers have the ability of exposing APIs in a Fire standard format. The, the policy enforcement that happens there happens through OpenID Connect, and there are multiple layers and multiple aspects that will take place in, uh, in the Fire server as well as the policy enforcement point. So that's what's shown at the top part of this diagram. The bottom part of this diagram is basically connectivity to backend systems. Right? So, so you have EMR connectors, Fire data mapping connectors, accelerators, validators, your identity systems, etc., which is able to connect to multiple backend systems. On the left-hand side of the diagram, you see API and integration developers who have access to pre-built Fire APIs. So if you're trying to be compliant with the rule, you'd basically pick a pre-built Fire API, uh, which is the defined APIs on HL7's uh, DaVinci, Karin, uh, US Co, and international standards. So you would pick any of those APIs from there, and uh, basically they start building your API out and the, the connectivity for those APIs are already available. But as an API developer, if you want to build a custom API or a non-healthcare API, you have the ability of doing that as well. All right, let me zoom into this diagram next uh, and, and go into the specific modules that are available as part of the diagram. If you can remember the di previous diagram, you already have the users, you have application developers, you have clients, uh, they might be accessing APIs directly, or they might be accessing APIs via Smart on Fire apps, right? So there are different e stakeholders as part of this ecosystem. Uh, you then have the API and transformation layer, which is the layer responsible for connecting to multiple systems, transforming that data, and exposing that in a specific API format. So as part of that, you have the control plane, if you want to get into technical details, the control plane side of the story on the left, which is the API marketplace where APIs are available, the API designer and explorer where you have pre-built APIs and you have the ability of exposing APIs and building your own APIs. You have API management capabilities, which focuses on lifecycle management, et cetera. Uh, you have the consent management capabilities where you track and manage consent. And then you have the analytics and intelligence capabilities as well. So all of that from a control plane side. From a runtime, site you have api gateways as well as pre-built fire servers and uh, pre-built fire apis excuse me pre-built fire apis running on the fire server as well as api gateway there's a consent enforcement site there and an api access control site there from a security perspective uh, <clears throat> and, and so and then, then of course you have the api gateway standard api support as well uh, if you see that box there on healthcare data accelerators, so there are pre-built accelerators that can connect to multiple types of system. I'll, I'll be going into some screenshots on that next. Right? The box just below that is the data layer. Right? So the data layer focuses on the various types of uh, data that the data that can be stored. Right? So you have a consent repository where you store the consent information of who gave access to what, when, and where. And there's, there's a whole delegated consent management piece there as well. Uh, you have an asynchronous fire repository. Right? I'll talk about that next, where you can store some of the data and, and uh, consume that data as and when required. And then, of course, you have the user repository where you store user information. Right? And then, of course, you have the systems layer at the end where that's the backend system. So those are the facilities which can be at hospitals, which can be at uh, insurance companies, uh, which can be on the cloud, but there'll be multiple systems, right, residing in multiple facilities. Uh, certain facilities might have Cerner, Epic, all scripts as their EMR systems. Uh, you have, as I mentioned, wearable devices coming into the picture as well. Uh, there is a lot of data still sitting in databases in a raw format, uh, not stored in specific healthcare uh, data formats. So you should be able to connect to those systems very easily, convert those data into uh, transformation, like in, into, into data sources and expose them externally. 
so let me go into one more layer, uh, which is basically the the different components that WC2 and Pink provide. Right? And and of course we'll be sharing this diagram. But as you can see, if you can see the colors there, the orange color is what WC2 provides. So just the API management capabilities, uh, pre-built fire servers, and the APIs, etc. Uh, what's shown in blue is what Ping provides, uh, and the, so the API intelligence part, the user repository, etc. And then what's shown in that light green color is what both Ping and WSO2 can provide. Right? So you can pick and choose uh, where you need those components from based on the features, based on your requirements, based on uh, where you're coming from, so on and so forth. So there's a very flexible model of picking and choosing what components you require. But at the end of the day, it's a full end-to-end -end healthcare interoperability solution that can provide you the total set of requirements that are required for the ONC regulation, for the CMS patient access final view rule, for the provider directory API requirement, uh, so on and so forth. Right? So the total set of requirements from the interoperability and API side all the way up to the security side. And that's where this powerful partnership works. Uh, okay, so I spoke about the FHIR repository. I'm just going to go into a little bit of detail there. So that's basically to show that on the left-hand side, you have real-time access to APIs, right? So, so that's the standard way, and 70% and of the time, that's, that's why you might be using, right? So you call an API that goes into the platform that does, does all of the security and enablement side of things and goes to the backend, fetches the data, transforms it on the fly, and uh, returns it back. There is also a set of requirements and there is a specification as well to store data. That's the FHIR repository specification where you would fetch data periodically, maybe in an ETL manner and store that data in the FHIR repository before being able to consume that data. So when you do a data request that actually hits the FHIR repository and fetches data from there, Periodically, that goes to backends and collects data, transforms them, and stores them in, in some kind of a storage. Both these requirements exist, and the platform supports both these capabilities. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is very quickly uh, just take like five minutes max and go into some of the screenshots uh, so that you have a view of what the platform looks like uh, before handing it over to Francois. And, and the screenshots are really snapshots of, uh, of our accelerator. Right. So, so we have API management accelerators, data transformation accelerators, and, and system connectivity accelerators. Uh, so screenshot number one is basically pre-built Fire APIs and the API designer. So this is the API designing part. So if you are an insurance company or a provider, you would come into the platform. You are the API designer in this case, and you have access to pre-built APIs. So these APIs are coming from the carrying specification, the DaVinci specification, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are the only platform that has out-of-the-box pre-built swagger definitions of the uh, different HL7 profiles out there. Uh, so once you pick which APIs you want, you have the ability of selecting those APIs, and those APIs are then available for you to expose externally. Right? So if you click on any of those APIs, like explanation of benefits, you can go in and see the Swagger definition, uh, you can see the different resources under that. And if required, you can change that. But in this, since this is a regulation, uh, you, you wouldn't really change that, right? But if required, you can. Uh, so once you've selected the pre-built APIs, you then go into the API designer side. Right? So this is the general uh, designer screenshot. If you look at the toolbar on the left, it shows the different configurations you have for a single API. I've just paused on the lifecycle tab here to show that each API can have a lifecycle stage. So here it's moving from a, a created stage to a prototype stage to a published stage. And when you publish it, it, it ends up in a marketplace. Right? But you have the ability of, of setting rate limits, or setting scopes, uh, setting uh, design time configurations, so on and so forth, and monetization rules on top of these APIs. Again, as I mentioned, these can be pre-built Fire APIs, or it can be standard uh, APIs or, or any custom APIs that you want to build and expose as well. Uh, another deeper view, uh, so this is focusing on the runtime configurations of that API. 
And as you can see, there are different types of security aspects there as well. Like you have the transport level security setting, application level security setting, uh, the ability to validate schemas. Uh, so do a schema validation on this, uh, so on and so forth as well. And if you look at the right hand side, there's a throughput part of this because one important thing in the rule is is that these apis are mostly public right so you have to have the ability of controlling the apis uh, figuring out like who has access to these apis and more importantly rate limiting or throttling those apis as well right so you, so that you don't get overwhelmed with the requests right so the the gateway should be able to handle those aspects as well uh, from 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 basically uh, the design part, you also have the ability of of doing swagger as well. Right, so this is a integrated swagger view that basically shows you that you can go into the code level and uh, design those APIs or modify those APIs. So once you're done with the design part, then it comes to the marketplace side. Right? So this is a screenshot of the API marketplace where you have different APIs uh, shown in a public developer portal or an enterprise developer portal and this is where application developers a different set of users would come in and sign up for these apis test these apis read documentation about these apis and fetch the keys for that api so that they can start building the applications around these APIs. Right? so this would be a, a very themed portal which is very specific to your organization or it might be a public portal out there where you can register your apis so there was the design part of APIs. This is the consumption part of APIs or the developer portal. When you actually do your consumption, you go through a fire server, right? The re regulation states that the fire server should have a capability statement that returns back what the capabilities are of that specific uh, fire gateway, right? So th this is a view of this capability statement that's generated on the fly. So, that's the API part, but then you also need the connectivity to backend systems. So for that, what we've done is we've built auto-generated data transformation connectors for Fire, HL7, so on and so forth. Uh, so if you if you need to connect to a, a practitioner data source or patient data source, that connectivity is also available out of the box. Right? So we have so you can basically go into the low-code integration platform as shown here, uh, drag and drop. Uh, these building blocks and that will build your integration for you. So if it's a standard integration, like for example, let's say it's an explanation of benefits API and you're connecting to uh, an EMR system which has explanation of benefits available as a fire API, then you don't need to go through these steps. You just say, I want to connect to that and that will expose everything for you uh, immediately. But if you have a non-standard backend source, then you have the you require the ability to do low code integration and be able to do transformation on the fly. Right? That's where we have a bunch of mediators and, and building blocks to be able to create these transformations. Like for example, if you want to build a fire bundle out of multiple sources, you have the ability of doing that. Uh, if you want to do like very specific transformation like HL7 V2 to fire, uh, we have an automated way of doing that. And if your data resides in data bases or in different data sources, you then need data mapping capability where you can map specific items or specific fields into the fire specific or standard compliant field so so we have a automated visual data mapping tool to help you with that as well so those are the integration requirements uh, last slide from me is consent management right so from a consent management perspective this is key because since you have application developers in the ecosystem and you have patients as well, patients need to be able to provide consent to the application developers. And we split that into three parts. The parts where you, you basically request for the consent, so that's the application developer saying that I need these kinds of consents in the system. You then have the collection of consents where the patient uh, via a login screen or whatever is able to say that he or she provides very specific access to my date of birth, for example, right, to this kind of application. So you need to have a way of basically providing consent uh, to this specific data field. And then of course you have consent-based filtering, right, which, is the, uh, which is the enforcement side of things, right, where at some policy enforcement point, 
the system is able to determine whether you do have access to this system and you as a patient you also should be able to go and revoke consent whenever and wherever required so let me pause there uh, and this is a good segue to hand over to francois so francois can take over from here uh, let me do the logistical part of that where i change presenter to francois yeah. Thanks for fun. That's all to you. Thanks. Thank you. I think you're still sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay. This is very good. So I think you need to pass this to me somehow, Mafon, on your. Oh, okay. Let me try that again. There we go. Now I got it. Thanks, Mufan. Um, so for my part, I'm going to focus on API security considerations. We're going to look at specific scenarios, API security scenarios that are applicable to fire and, and uh, uh, healthcare in general. So there's a lot of sources for security considerations. If you're looking at improving your security posture for your fire implementation, uh, great sources of inspiration for security test cases, for example. So API security best practices, OWASP has a great list that came out last year that includes uh, top vulnerabilities that, that seem to happen on APIs. We'll just get to your presentation more here. So those are not necessarily fire specific, but like you have for any other digital transformation uh, built on APIs, risks that are common that are uh, associated with the use of APIs. Obviously, the fire specification has its own security consideration section, lots of great source of information. Smart on fire similarly has a lot of security um, considerations, although smart on fire is more about the intra aspect of API security. So if we if we look at the OWASP top 10 API security vulnerabilities, what are those things? It's important uh, to realize that this is not, these are not a list of threats that you need to protect against. These are really a list of common vulnerabilities that happen in your APIs, right? And, and you've seen a lot of tooling that uh, WSO2, that my father was showing that that uh, allows you to add security on top of those APIs. Uh, but like everything that is rule-based, uh, there tends to be you know, some oversight sometimes. So you, you know, you, sometimes you will forget to attach a policy to an API or an API comes out of nowhere and you, you didn't apply the specific uh, you know, security scrutiny and things like that. So OWASP API Security Top 10, uh, it's, it's a great way to look at your API security from the perspective of what are the typical things that do go wrong in my APIs. Uh, you see a lot of things around uh, identity, right, which we directly address at, I think, identity. So things like broken authentication number two, you know, having a stronger authentication really helps here. Broken object level authorization or broken function level authorization. Those are, those are uh, you know, uh, gaps in your uh, access control gaps in your authorization layer that typically happens there uh, as part of your API infrastructure, as well as a lot of, of, of things that are really relevant to uh, fire and, and healthcare in general, like the data exposure, uh, injection, anything that can disrupt your service is something that uh, you need to take into consideration. So, but beyond a wasp, right? Why is it that API security incidents are still happening? And we do see a lot of those. So the, the, the one thing I'll say about that is it's important to understand that most attacks are conducted using valid accounts, right? So you you, you will from a security API security perspective, you know, you tend to focus a lot on authentication and authorization. And that that's that's a really critical uh, layer of API security. Um, but hackers are users too, right? So hackers using existing credentials, valid credentials, valid accounts, maybe a hacker is just registering on, uh, on your platform or maybe through credential stuffing, credentials are stolen, or you've got some client side applications, uh, you know, the smart stuff that, that tends to not be very good at, at, at keeping secrets confidential, things 
leak out of logs or GitHub public repos and things like that. So all of these weaknesses are used by external hackers and insiders to go after your fire APIs. So what we're doing with ping intelligence for APIs is really adding an additional layer of security beyond things that you would traditionally do that is based on rules. So with Pink Intelligence for APIs, this additional layer is really looking at behaviors. Behaviors, how, how is your API behaving and how are all these different API clients that are consuming those Fire APIs, how are those uh, behaving? And, and we're analyzing behaviors without the need for rules. It's really leveraging big data and machine learning in order to automatically create uh, these models. So Ping Intelligence for APIs will receive from WSO2, I, I'm showing here three separate WSO2 uh, sources here. So you might have different clusters, WSO2 or different cloud deployments. You might also have APIs that are not on WSO2. So all, all of these APIs generate metadata that are fed to Ping Intelligence for APIs via integrations like we have for WSO2. So we aggregate this API traffic metadata from multiple API silos and we produce insight So the monitoring aspect that Mafan was talking about earlier. So we will give you insights about your API. We will allow you to track the different users calling these APIs. And I'm gonna uh, give you a demo soon. And then we leverage AI to detect and block attack in progress. So how does that happen? So this behavior-based API security, again, is, is about creating models from your API traffic metadata, right? Machine learning is about big data. You, you, you take a lot of data and you create a mathematical model from it. So in this case, the big data is your API traffic metadata, right? Your Fire APIs are gonna be called by clients. Every time those calls happen, there's metadata associated to it. And you gradually feed this uh, to our AI, which builds these models. And at runtime, we are in inspecting API traffic uh, uh, that is going through. And we actually compare that to the model that was created based on the historical access. And we're looking for deviations from that model. So that's a, 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 an, an alternative way if you want to catch a hacking behavior in progress. And once we do make a prediction of a hack in progress, we can go back to WSO2 and say, you should block this client. So we automate the not only the detection, but the blocking of these attacks. So I will go through a number of different uh, scenarios relating to API security here uh, in the context of a fire uh, environment here. So let me just get out of presentation mode and switch onto uh, my sandbox here. So I've got a Ping Intelligence uh, sandbox here where there's a number of different APIs going. And we're gonna talk about, you know, at the beginning, the discovery of APIs, the learning, the grouping, uh, and the insights that you get uh, just out of box here. So I've got two different API groups here, WSO2 East, WSO2 West. I've got different APIs, but you know, from a, a lifecycle perspective, it all starts with an API being discovered. So I have on purpose an API that haven't uh, been published in the AI layer here. Uh, it's a, it's, it's, uh, it's been discovered by Ping Intelligence for API. So you can see that this, this uh, uh, fire uh, API is, is exposed, something that wasn't known before. Uh, and why would that happen? You know, maybe you've got an application that exposes an API uh, as an implementation detail, or maybe this is happening in another group, and, and from a security perspective, you weren't aware of that. So this is coming up for the first time. So we'll give you detailed information about what we discovered about these APIs. Let me show you here uh, a dis discovery detail report for that particular API. So we'll show you, you know, which which host name this is targeting. You know, what is the base bad GRC function? Well. We'll even go and, and, and tell you what we've noticed are the different resources that are called, the uh, what it produces, application JSON. So that gives you information about uh, the API that you may not be aware of uh, initially. But after a while, this API is published, you 
you add it to the different groups that you have in place. And let me show you what it looks like after a little while here. Let's look at this fire scheduling API. Uh, so if I go on this dashboard for this API, we'll basically show you the traffic that is specific to this API, regardless of the different uh, clusters that you're coming from. We'll show you the different uh, URLs for this, this fire API. So we'll show you which IP address uh, are the API clients coming from when they are calling this Fire API, as well as the usernames for this API. So if I go look at this particular user here, you'll see the different Fire APIs that have been called by that user over time, right? The history of it. So we're looking at the last seven days here. You, you see the different uh, tokens. Those are JOT tokens that are being used by uh, that user when they're calling the Fire API. And you can even get you know, the history of what a token has been up to. So here we cross-reference back the user and the different uh, APIs that, that you're getting. So this is additional insights about your API traffic that is tagged with the identity information that we're capturing uh, live here. So let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, we were looking at the last seven days. We're going to look at the last 60 days here. And what you'll see is that um, Earlier in the life cycle of the sandbox, I've created some attack simulations. Those are the black lines that you see here. So let me let's go into the first scenario, uh, which is an anomaly detection. So you've got an internal malfunction that leads to a service exhaustion. So this is actually a, a common scenario. Uh, you've got a situation where you've got maybe it's an internal microservice that calls this fire patient info API. Uh, it leads to a service disruption. So how do you stop this and how do you find what is the cause of this, right? So this is not malicious. This is maybe you had uh, an internal microservice that because it wasn't coming from the outside gate, it wasn't submitted to a rate limit, for example, uh, in WSO2. So in Ping Intelligence for APIs, in this case, you've got a token on the blacklist, and that's the token that was used as part of that simulation. If I take a look at that token, you will see uh, that the patient info, the fire patient info API was what was targeted. Uh, you can see the API activity associated to that token. So this, this by now has been blocked. Like whenever something is on the blacklist, it's already blocked so that that token is no longer able to call the patient info API, but this is what happened back on uh, November 8th here. And you see the different attack classifications associated to this. So that behavior triggered a couple of attack classifications uh, in Ping identity, including data exfiltration uh, and content scraping. And if I go into the attack insights for this incident, you will see information associated with that, including uh, the forensics uh, data uh, where you can see side by side the API activity, the attacks, and the specifics of which API calls were made as part of this attack. If this was malicious, this detailed information is very important for you to be able to remediate uh, the problem, uh, right? So, in the case, for example, of this incident, if I go back to this token and I look at this uh, other attack classification, you will get information such as, you know, you might have an OWASP API security top 10 number four type vulnerability here, which means, you know, I can see here that the activity is the factor that has been exceeded. So maybe I have a lack of rate limit on this API. So I should go back my, my WSO2 and maybe attach a policy in a different way uh, to this, this particular API. So anomaly detection. Your just like you have for a lot of different APIs, another attack vector for your fire environment is going to be the authentication, um, the authenticate the 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 authentication server. So you might have like a fire off endpoint in your environment in, that is used in order to recreate tokens, right? Um, so Ping Intelligence for APIs is tracking authentication attempts against those types of APIs. We also have a Ping Fed connector that uh, allows you to mine this information if you're using that in your fire environment. Um, and the left side of the slide here is, is an, a different attack scenario, one in which there's a bug in your API that 
if you completely skip the token, the API is still working. So this sounds weird, but uh, that is the source of, of the vulnerability of a lot of, of API incidents that have happened in the past. And in Pig Intelligence for APIs, you'll see what it looks like here. If I pick that uh, first IP address here on my blacklist, you see this unauthorized client attack. So unauthorized client attack means that's just that. You've got an API that, uh, a client that called the API without a valid token or cookie. Uh, and, and, and normally that would be blocked by a gateway, you know, if your policies are set up properly. But for whatever reason, in this case, it is not. Right, so this is a vulnerability that you might need to go and remediate in your API. Um, so that's uh, unauthorized client attack, uh, a, a credential stuffing attack, uh, very similar, also tagged as an OWASP API security top 10 number two. So you can see the, the credential stuffing attack, uh, extended credential stuffing on, uh, at a larger time scale here. Uh, these simulations are based on uh, insights that we're getting from our customers based on what they are seeing in the real world, right? So these are types of attack where um, uh, 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 an API client, like via a bot or something like that, is going to try a set of credentials maybe only once every 20 minutes, right? Taking their time, coming back two weeks later and see how many hits they get. So because those are slow attacks, they're hard to detect, uh, but we are tracking um through the machine learning analysis that we're doing we're tracking success failure rates across these different clients and we can spot these over time uh in uh the next scenario here you've got a, a more sophisticated hacker here so that hacker is utilizing the advantage of having this valid account in order to get a, a new token every time. So when I when I simulate this in my environment, uh, in my fire distributed probing, you'll see that you know when I run this, every single time I make a call, I just get a fresh token, right? So it makes it harder for a traditional security layer to pinpoint the origin of the attack. And without being able to pinpoint the origin, you can't easily stop it. Um, so for us, what it looks like, you know, and in Ping Intelligence for APIs is an identity being blocked. So insider here, insider at my.org, that is the user identity that is now blacklisted by Ping Intelligence for APIs. So what that means is that at the point at which we make that prediction of the attack in progress, the user is added to the blacklist. At that point, it doesn't matter which token you're coming from. It doesn't matter. Uh, which environment you're coming from, this is going to be blocked automatically. So you can see the attack classifications here. So I can tell we're running out of time here. So let me just talk to you about API sequence modeling. So API sequence modeling is really about taking advantage of the fact that typically when a user is calling Fire APIs, they're not calling Fire APIs directly, right? Users are using smart apps. Um, and those, those smart apps have a, a, a GUI in it that will restrict how the different API calls are sequenced together. And this is the kind of stuff that we analyze over time. Um, and with Ping Intelligence for APIs, we have the ability to compare runtime traffic with these sequences. So by modeling these sequences, we can uh, catch hacking behaviors that have happened outside of those client-side apps. And lastly, the last trick I want to talk to you about here before we run out of time is the decoys. The idea is that you've got fake API endpoints that are not known by your real applications, but that are likely to be attempted by a hacker. And so as soon as somebody touches uh, a decoy, an API decoy, we flag them. So we're effectively uh, and stopping the attack before it even starts. So that's it. Thanks a lot for uh, joining so far. I, I will be looking for questions right now. Um, here is some contact information that uh, you can use in the meantime. 
Thanks, thanks, Francois. Uh, great session. So, so there are some questions on the questions tab, and we'll just leave it on this uh, next steps slide as well, and we'll copy some of these contacts into the chat group too. Uh, but if you have any follow-ups, just reach out to any one of us, and, and we can definitely talk to you about the products in detail and talk, talk to you about the, the security use cases as well. Uh, there was one question, I think, Francois. This is for you. Uh, the feature of ping indicated uh, is used only with WSO2, or do we get the same feature if our existing client is using other API gateways like AWS, Kong, RPG, X-Ray, et cetera? I'm assuming the answer is yes, but uh, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, yeah. it is. So, so for us, you know, we want to maximize the sources of the API traffic that you analyze. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we do have integrations with like Amazon CloudFront, uh, we have integrations with other API gateways. You, you can even hook us up into a load balancer. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can mine this API traffic data, and that's really important. The richer the data that you have, the better your models end up being. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, Francois. Uh, there's another question, I think, <clears throat> that's for me. So do we have a list of connectors and description of high-level connectors for WSO2 for EMR, EHR? Uh, does WZ to support DICOM and other uh, providers as well? Okay, so yes, so we, we do have a list of uh, connectors. As I mentioned, there are a bunch of accelerators which is listed in the slide uh, on the website as well. We do have that list, uh, so we can definitely share that with you. Uh, yeah, so I, I think there, there is a bunch of other questions, but since we're at the top of the hour, we, we can respond to these questions. We have your, your questions as well, so we can individually reach out to you. Uh, as we mentioned previously, we will be sharing the slides and the recording uh, on the sites as well as we'll be reaching out to you. But if you have any questions at all, or if you want to a product deep dive or to want to talk to Ping O W S O two, just reach out to one of us and we can loop in the uh, the other group as well. Uh, thanks again for everyone uh, joining this webinar. Hopefully that this was interesting and useful, and uh, hope to see you in the future in in one of our future webinars. Thanks again and thanks, Francois. Thanks, Safa. Thank you.